Howdy. Welcome to Think Theism. I'm your host, Zach Lawson. Normally, I'm joined by my co-host, Andrew Robbins. Uh, the part of Andrew Robbins will be played tonight by Samuel Blackman. Howdy. Today, we're joined in studio with Dr. Robin Collins, uh, professor of philosophy at Messiah College. How are you doing today? I'm Dr. good. Is Aggieland treating you well? Um, Aggieland was is treating me well. It was nice and warm last night, but it turned <laughs> cool this morning. Oh, yeah. Probably much better <clears throat> than Pennsylvania, uh, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so you're a philosopher, and you've written on just about every philosophical debate. Um, for people that aren't quite familiar with your work, um, could you provide just kind of a brief overview of, of your interests and uh, sort of the research projects you're working on now? So my main interest is in, um, let's say, philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, and then particularly philosophy of religion and how they overlap philosophy of religion and what's called um, philosophical theology. Mm -hmm. um, so I've written on, you know, um, interpretations of quantum mechanics, mind-body problem, problem of evil, um, evolution. Um, but my main work, and what I'm most known for, is the work on um, the fine-tuning of the cosmos mm -hmm. as evidence for the existence of God. So um, I did a lot of that work for what's called the fine-tuning for um, of life, which I'll mostly talk about tonight in mm -hmm. the um, debate. Um, by 2009, and my current project, which is about a, almost a 10-year project, is how the universe is not only fine-tuned for life, but finally adjusted mm -hmm. so that we can do science, scientific technology and discovery. Right. Disco the discoverability problem. Discoverability that, issue, so. right. And mm -hmm. it makes a major, it's really important complement mm -hmm. to the fine-tuning for life argument. Mm -hmm. I uh I've read a little bit on that, um, particularly the fine-tuning of the fine structure constant for, right. um, I believe it's uh, for sustainable fires. Is right, that, is that that's correct? part yeah. of it, yeah. Yeah, um, one of my friends described this to me as saying, well, if it was too low, then all the cavemen would freeze, and if it was too high, they would burn off the atmosphere every time that they uh, tried to make a campfire. Is that... Well, the burning off the atmosphere is um, not correct. If it's too high, mm -hmm. um, wood fires would just go out. Oh, okay. Because there would be yeah. too much radiation... If you have like a wood fire and it's um, – there's combustion mm -hmm. um, pr producing energy in. There's then energy going out in smoke and radiation. That's why you feel warmth. And what governs the – besides the temperature, what governs the amount going out in radiation is the fine structure constant, which it tells you what is um, uh, the strength of electromagnetism. And mm -hmm. so like if it's – the amount going on radiation is proportional to the square of that. So if you made like – the fine structure constant twice as large, you get four times as much going out in radiation, but the amount in combustion would stay the same, mm -hmm. and the amount going out in smoke would stay the same, so the only thing, there's more now going out in radiation, the temperature of the fire would go down, and would go down below the combustion point, and mm -hmm. so it would go out. Yeah, very interesting. So we live in that fine area between darkness and Fire right. world. And right. then if you yeah. go the other direction, there would be way more forest fires. Mm -hmm. um, um, houses would burn down a lot more easily, but then there's a whole bunch of other effects. Resolving power of light microscope goes down. Electric transformers become rapidly really inefficient. Electric motors. So our, our whole scientific civilization is dependent on it being within a narrow range. Mm. That was the first case I found. Very, very interesting uh, stuff. Um, w would you say that the fine-tuning argument, in your estimation, is the strongest argument for theism, um, or is it just one of several that are— Well, equal? I mean, I would say it's, for me, mm -hmm. the fine-tuning and other things connected with science. I would say the—I had written a paper, God and the Laws of Nature, that the world is orderly at all. Um, we wouldn't expect that on a chance hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And I would say the mathematical structure, quantum mechanics, those three, I think, to me, make an utterly compelling um, case mm -hmm. for that there is um, a mind under. I would say a mind underlying er everything. Now, you have to go from there to the god being a god mm -hmm. of classical theism, but you've gone a long ways. For, for sure. Uh, so perhaps pointing in the opposite direction, um, at, at least in my estimation, the best argument against the existence of God would probably be the problem of evil. Um, yes. For sure. And that's something that I know that you've done some work on. Um, yeah, I would well. just say one thing about the problem of evil. I mm -hmm. combine that, if you can, can combine the fine-tuning argument with the problem of evil, and so you say, well, what we are is highly vulnerable embodied conscious agents, and mm -hmm. if we're highly vulnerable, that's one thing going to mean God's not going to intervene 
all the time, so we're vulnerable to each other. Mm-hmm. So um, we're dependent on other people's choices of whether our lives are good or bad and vulnerable to the environment. So then you have to look, and, and if we are vulnerable like that, there's inevitably going to be a lot of evil, suffering in the form of natural evil and moral evil. So then it really becomes the probability of highly vulnerable embodied conscious agents under theism, mm-hmm. okay? And as long as you can glimpse a reason why an all-good God would create such beings, it's not going to be super small. Whereas the fine-tuning tells you that to get body conscious agents, period, whether vulnerable or not, is super, super small. Mm -hmm. So basically the probability is far smaller of evil plus beings like us than it is under theism. So you get this massive confirmation for theism if you combine the two together. Now that doesn't give a reason why God allowed evil, which is the project of theodicy, but Mm -hmm. it shows that when you combine the two together with the fine-tuning, you actually get a really strong case for God. You've kind of absorbed the um, strongest argument on the other side. Very very interesting. Um, So you mentioned there, as long as you can glimpse a reason why God would allow that, um, some people might not be able to. In fact, I sometimes struggle to see why God would allow evil um, at times. And, And many of my Christian friends also tell me that maybe we shouldn't be looking for those reasons, um, like we wouldn't expect to it. Um, so first, is there a reason to expect that we should be able to see something like that? And if so, what what do you think that reason We should be? be able to see some of the reasons. I think, you know, um, often when I do an activity, there's multiple reasons why I do it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of overdetermined. So we should expect there to be multiple reasons, first of all, why God would allow evil. And we also should expect, given God's mind is infinite, ours are finite, that we're not going to know all the reasons. But given that God has created us in his image and that um, I'd mentioned the fine-tuning for discovery indicates that God wants us to use our reason, explore the universe, we would expect that we would be able to find some of the reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think what you would initially expect is we'd have some idea of some of the reasons but not all the reasons. So there's, of course, the classic... Um, um, reason given by the free will theodicy. It's free will. I don't think that's sufficient in itself, so I've, um, I've supplemented that with um, what I call the connection-building theodicy, and others have encouraged me to call it the love theodicy. So I can go to, mm-hmm. into explaining just the basic idea of that if you want. Sure, I, I, absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. What's the connection-building theodicy? So the connection-building theodicy builds off the virtuous response theodicy, or um, Swinburne, Richard Swinburne's a famous philosopher of religion, his theodicy, called the responsibility theodicy, is that there's some value in God's allowing both natural and moral evil because we can affect virtuous respond to it by like acts of courage or self-sacrificial love. So if we didn't experience any evil, there wouldn't be any self-sacrificial love. There wouldn't be any courage doing the morally right thing while risking our skin, so on and so forth. And Richard Swinburne stresses that um, this makes us responsible for each other, and that's a good thing. The problem with both of those is they don't have anything beyond this world. So it, intuitively, it doesn't seem to me those things are good enough if they, we, our lives just end at the end mm-hmm. to outweigh all the suffering in the world. So what you need is an eternal good that comes out of those. And the connection-building theodicy um, provides that. So the idea is, is that, um, let's say, you help me in my um, time of suffering. You're there with me. Um, you're helping me that builds a connection between us. And we, and, and we see that people in wartime, like if you saved my life in wartime and I lost track of you, I'd probably spend, and a lot of people do, a good portion of their time trying to find that person because mm-hmm. they feel a special connection with them. And we also, when we contribute to other people's lives in a deep way, there's a particular satisfaction we get out of that. I think, And, and it's not just simple pleasure, like the pleasure of a pig, but it's a moral satisfaction. Mm-hmm. So we recognize those as good things. What the connection-building theodicy says is those things don't just last for this life, but that connection's eternal, because okay. so it lives in our conscious memory. So the we're, we're con- when... Um, in the afterlife, all things will be brought to life. We'll be aware of all those things others have contributed to them and feel that connection, experience it. So it will be a real thing okay. that we're connected with people in this way. And since it lasts forever, if it's good at all, 
its goodness keeps increasing. So it's plausible then to think that its goodness will outweigh the evils because it's an eternal good outweighs finite evils. And presumably some of those connections only can be formed by very intense moral suffering. Or, uh, yeah, moral so. suffering. They're what I call evil transformative connections is what mm-hmm. I call them, that you certain kinds of connections like forgiving somebody else, right. being appreciative for being forgiven or helping somebody in their times of suffering cannot be formed otherwise. Others could be. I mean, Jane could bake a cake for Jill on her trillionth birthday in heaven with a trillion <laughs> candles. Yeah. Yeah. And... That would be a connection that doesn't require suffering, but there'd be a whole set of connections that would be missing from reality. Mm -hmm. So if these are good things, then if God didn't create a world that allowed for evil and us being vulnerable, those would be missing from reality. Yeah, so it seems like that goes a a, a pretty good way explaining perhaps some of the connections between human beings uh, and other moral agents. Uh, there's another class of evil, you know, natural evil. Um, we look at the history of evolution. We see nature red in tooth and claw, you know, animals dying and suffering and killing each other. Um, it doesn't seem to me it, it, on the surface that the connection-building theodicy applies to that type of evil. Unless we assume a deeper sort of connection okay. of, um, you know, um, Romans 8 and other places in Scripture talk about the redemption of all creation, that somehow our redemption pulls along the rest of creation, so then there is a connection there. Now, I think animal suffering still is uh, bothers one, and I think maybe we have to go on beyond what we normally think of, even thinking of what animals are. So here's a hypothesis I've toyed with, that maybe animals are part of some larger consciousness manifestations of it. They're not into, they're maybe some gain individuality that are with humans. Actually, C.S. Lewis thought this, that, you know, your cat gains a kind of personhood, but out in the wild, they're not. Mm -hmm. And if they're just manifestations of some larger consciousness, then it's not like the individual suffering we experience. And that consciousness itself could have, you know, um, grow and um, be redeemed. So I, I would say we know so little about animal consciousness. We make presumptions about it. It's like us, but we know so little that, you know, um, all kinds of speculations are should be on the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, have you ever are you familiar with the work of uh, Trent Dougherty in this? Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of it. I just haven't got around to reading oh, yeah. this book on yeah. it. I read that a few years ago, and it was the first time I'd been exposed to the idea that animals might have an opening to personhood, and it was the strangest thing to read at the time. Um, but the more I think about it, the more it's... it's, it's I remember C.S. Lewis, Lewis somebody raised the objection, oh, yeah. well, what about mosquitoes? He said, well, <laughs> I can think of... Uh, Mosquito heaven and a human hell is quite compatible. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, so uh, perhaps evolution then are, isn't really that much of a problem for theism in general, um, at least not on the problem of it's a pro- and it's a Well, I would say it's a problem for a too narrow view of reality. Okay. So, and, um, you know, God, God is a big God. God is infinite. Mm-hmm. And a lot of things we thought were how things would be plausible about the nature of things, like, you know, a mechanical world, we find quantum mechanics, which is very puzzling. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we make a lot of presumptions. And um, if you make certain presumptions, then it becomes more of a problem than other presumptions. Okay. What about the issue of, uh, or the specific Christian doctrines that appear to be threatened by evolution? Things like historical Adam, maybe, or some people might presume that there's no death before the fall. It seems like an evolutionary story might be in conflict with with some of those core. Uh, well, it would be in conflict. It would it, it presses. It makes it difficult to hold on a literal first couple okay. of Adam and Eve. But you also have to look for the biblical base. First of all, the biblical basis for that, even, and that Adam actually in the Hebrew means every you know every man. It's a generic term. It's like saying man, mm-hmm. okay, and woman, okay. So it um, it's been interpreted as literal Adam and Eve. But a, and if you take a literal garden, it also doesn't make sense. Uh, like a literal snake, the snake is said to be the most clever beast of the field. Well, even they knew the snake wasn't the most clever beast of the field, okay? So it has all the, all the uh, marks of being an allegory. So first of all, yeah, it presents a problem for a literal first Adam and Eve, but not a, necessarily a group of human beings, which the core of the doctrine of original sin is basically, um, I'd say for every major religion, I should say, has 
some kind, something like original sin, because they have a, a way of enlightenment or salvation. So how do we get in this bad situation? The core of the doctrine of original sin is that, first of all, we are in a situation, our desires are in some sense distorted or corrupted. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's why we need salvation, one of the reasons. And second, that it's not, God didn't just simply create us in the state, but it's a result of human free choice. And evolution allows for both of those. So you could have your you know, first group of hominids who gained moral awareness. They knew God, and they maybe even had additional powers over nature. We don't know, you know, mm-hmm. psychic powers and things like that because of their spiritual connection. But then the idea is that they turned away. But of course, that's not all going to get expressed in Scripture because that would be um, as far beyond right. your, your understanding so that it gets expressed in a story of Adam and Eve. So I think the doctrine of original sin is perfectly compatible with the evolutionary view of human beings for those reasons and doesn't really undercut it at all. Mm. Uh, it, it seems like you're not alone. A recent Pew study came out about a year ago um, saying that about 60 percent of American Protestants agree with the view that uh, creation came about through God either guiding evolution or allowing evolution uh, to occur. So, it, you know, when I was growing up, it seemed like there was a big fight between evolution and creationism, but it seems like culturally a lot of that's uh, kind of kind of fading away. Um, the thing that does stick with me, though, is this term God guiding evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, many of my friends that are like hardcore evolution people tend to say that's just, you're just a creationist, you just want to be accepted by your friends. So you slap on this guiding evolution. How exactly does, mechanistically, does that make sense to say God guided evolution? Okay, so first of all, we've got to mean what we mean by evolution here, and the por- the core, the core part of saying um, God, how it distinguishes it from special creation, is in the case of special creation, there's not common ancestry. God, you know, some organisms at least, God just zaps them into being. Mm-hmm. So when you say God guided evolution, what you're meaning is you buy into the thesis of common ancestry. That means if we trace each of us back, you know, to our parents, the grandparents, you know, so on and so forth, eventually we get back to the, you know, first cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. That thesis is what's supported by the evidence. So the genetic evidence, the evidence of the fossil record, it supports common ancestry, does not support that it simply occurred by an unguided random chance mechanism. Okay. So... When you say guided evolution, first of all, you're saying, I'm affirming the thesis of common ancestry. Now, when you say God guided it, I don't think you want to say that. In, you'd want to say there's a lot of chance still involved. Mm-hmm. So maybe one th- way of cashing out this story is like um, in an analogy. It's like a student going to college. Okay, we, we confront a problem today of what we call helicopter parents. Mm-hmm right? That everything they want to know, calling up their student every day, figuring out what's going on and constantly intervening. God's not doing that with creation. But you might still think somebody is a good parent if the student really needs help. It can't get to the next point. Let's say they're running out of money um, and they cannot or they, they need psychiatric help. The parent will intervene, get them over that hump. So what you might think then when you talk about guided evolution, there are several humps. And besides getting to the first cell, which is a huge problem, the chemical evolution of how that could even occur, there's other humps. There's like the hump of sexual reproduction, which is still um, a mystery, or how how to get um, <clears throat> what they call the great leap, or multicellular organisms, the great leap, and then the Great Leap, which is where you suddenly, and you see this in the fossil record, when you get from hominids, let's say, <clears throat> before about 60,000 years ago, then afterwards, suddenly you see, you know, tool, a huge increase in tool use, like abstraction comes online, you know, burial of the dead, you see um, paintings that are representational, musical instruments, so suddenly there's this big leap in terms of um, intellectual spiritual, that whole across the board. So you could, might think that, God, you know, God generally lets it go, but occasionally mm-hmm. needs to um, give it um, some, some additional information or 
something like that, and that would be a form of guided evolution. Just kind of kicking it along super Yeah, super but it's not – you don't want it too involved because then, you know, you get – um, you're, you're basically back to special creation. Yeah, if you point, get it too, you know. if you get God, just every single you know thing, genetic defect. And part of the advantage of evolution, where it helps actually with the problem of evil, so it has a helpful side, and that's the nature red and tooth and claw. Before evolution, you would be saying, well, God created the malaria parasite. God <laughs> right. directly, God created the lion, and you know that's the whole red and tooth and claw, and that seems to make God more malicious. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it came about from this larger process and God had reasons for allowing this larger process, at least not God directly creating the nasty – some of the nasty organisms, mm-hmm. right? The viruses and all this stuff. Right. And and, and if you put a – it seems like a common theme with um, this idea of the connection building theodicy is that if you look at the entire history of our world, you know, from the Big Bang all the way into perhaps, you know, eternally into the future, you can see that that story – will do a lot to explain a lot of the uh, the, the apparent issues. And it puts us yeah. in, you know, we're deeply in, uh, unified mm-hmm. with the created order because we're on the same, like the animals, the same family tree. Mm-hmm. So in, in some sense, it makes, there's a bond, you know, a connection between us and animals and the rest of creation, but because we weren't specially created. For sure. Um, so you can see why that story would, uh, God would maybe have done things that way. That, yeah, I, I, I could definitely see that. Mm-hmm. Um, for for those those periods that you mentioned where God kind of lets um, stochastic random processes mm-hmm. take over for a little bit, um, you know, sort of hands off, um, as a part of the story of guided evolution there, um, there is a paper that I read, um, which, I mean, I have personal affinity to it, being a Molinist myself, which said uh, the title of it was The Impossibility of Evolution Apart from a God uh, Endowed with Middle Knowledge. Um, and essentially the idea being that if you have God intentionally guiding creation, um, if he at any point lets stochastic processes take over, um, he must have knowledge of those stochastic processes, uh, which then gets you into the realm of middle knowledge, where right. God has knowledge of you know counterfactuals. If I were to let things proceed this way, they would uh, come out this way. Now, stochastic, real quick. Oh, random processes, uh, basically random okay. would be the simplest right. way. Um, Somehow, I suspect you would not be on board with that idea. No, I mean, I'm not, you know, you could be a theological determinist or a Molinist and uh-huh. have, especially theological determinist, you could have God would eff- effectively guide it. How, uh-huh. However, you hack it, you just say yeah. God guided it because God determined everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you're, you know, so you get particular problem of evil arising. And in the case of, um, you know, the loving character of God, because God determining everything, everybody's evil acts. Um, in the Molinist perspective, I mean, Molinism has an attraction to me. I just simply can't make sense of it because it wants to hold on to have free will right. and these counterfactuals of freedom. And I don't, I, it seems like determinism in disguise to me. <laughs> and I don't see how, I, you know, um, how it works. It, it, it could work. So, um, it's an interesting big metaphysical right. system. I just don't think it, it it's uh, in the end coherent. Uh, I see. It, we're trying to have our cake in every world and also eat the cake in every other world. Right, possible. right. right. <laughs> now, with that said, is there any um, threat to God's sovereignty in terms of uh, un- uh, stochastic processes? Um, no, because I think let's define God's sovereignty just for a minute here um, and do a theological determinist versus what I would say an open theist view where God doesn't know what our free choices are um, and then the stochastic processes or something in between. We could assume God doesn't know that just for now. I'm not sure that's the case with stochastic processes, but um, it doesn't affect God's sovereignty because there's kind of two different definitions of sovereignty you could get. One is God controls everything. Mm-hmm. That's theological determinism. Molinism comes close to that. God selects what's ever, the possible world that's going to be actual. Whereas the other definition is God is in control. Um, that means if God can always stop anything, that you know, any of our free choices. So what I, I illustrate this in class, I have a bag of marbles. And so marbles are a power of, of um, agency, being able to freely make choices one way or another. And so in the determinist picture, God holds all the marbles for God's self. In this other picture, God gives them to people, 
okay? Mm -hmm. And then somebody usually starts fiddling with the marble. And then I go and I class, I grab the marble, yeah. like, I yell, I don't like what you're doing with it. <laughs> okay, that all startles everybody. But right. the idea is any time I could take that back. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's doing, uh, going too far, I can always stop it and override it. So I'm in control, mm -hmm. but I'm not controlling everything. And that's all that I think is required from sovereignty. That, that makes sense. Um, I would like to return a bit uh, back to the issue of original sin um, that, that you mentioned earlier, um, just to make a complete hard left. Uh, the question that, that I have in mind here is um, some people would consider a specific view of original sin as necessary for uh, Jesus's atonement uh, on, or the, uh, sorry, Jesus's sacrifice on the cross. Um, and you mentioned the group of people at the beginning of creation. Um, it seems like Paul's making the argument in Romans 5 that, you know, in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be alive. Uh, so I guess the first question that I have here is, does this view of a group of people do any damage to the atonement? Um, and secondly, what, what, what is atonement? Okay, well, maybe I'll answer the first question <laughs> first, because that will be get to the, get to second, the second question one. first, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there's different theories of atonement. Well, I, I guess specifically the, the question here is, the, I started off with that vague terminology, God guided evolution, right. we kind of went through there. The other vague thing that comes up is, you know, Jesus died for you. Right. And, and it seems like there are many views on what Jesus died for as there right. are Right. There's are, many are theories yeah. of atonement, um, um, theories being, and, and what it all, mm -hmm. we just simply say how and why, how Christ's death... Um, uh, rec um, saves us from sin and reconciles us to God, and what exactly those mean, and then mm -hmm. um, why would God use that method? Right. Okay, so I've written on what I call um, the incarnational theory or the participatory um, model of atonement. And so, I mean, I think that's the core idea. I, and part of it, I think, is it's in Paul. Um, if you read, like, Romans chapter 6, Paul talks about we if we die with Christ, then we'll, um, if we share in his death, we'll share in his resurrection. This is repeated by Paul, we died with Christ. So there's something about sharing in Christ's death and sharing in the resurrection life. So why would, the res why would that be necessary mm -hmm. for Christ's death? Well, the idea I have in mind is that, and it's very close to Eastern Orthodoxy, um, it kind of spells out some of the stuff that um, is in more Western philosophical terms. So the idea is that um, God the Son entered into as fully as possible our life situation of alienation from God, on the, uh, particularly on the cross, vulnerability, um, alienation from each other, and experience of finitude, vulnerability to suffering, so on and so forth. So, and then, nonetheless, God the Son, because he was without sin, acted in complete faith, hope, and love. So, these virtues were activated in God, which God and God's self can't exercise courage, because there's nothing, that, you know, there's, you exercise courage, at least in the way we do, mm -hmm. you have to, your skin has to be on the line, you have to experience, you have to have the experience that something bad could happen to me, well, God can have that experience in God's self apart from an incarnation. So God has that experience in the incarnation, nonetheless acts in complete faith, hope, and love. And so there's these new virtues activated. That's what Paul talks about when he talks about um, a new, what I claim is a new creation in Christ um, and putting on the new man. And so what we do is the atonement is we participate through the activity of the Holy Spirit in those new virtues become our virtues. So they get transferred to us. And of course, if we have the virtues of complete faith, hope, and love, that makes sin impossible. So we're saved from sin and we're reconciled to God. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be other things going on. There could be, you know, in classic penal theory, you could say, well, Jesus entered into the natural consequences of our sin, mm -hmm. which is alienation from God. So we actually took on, in some real sense, the punishment for our sin. You could incorporate it. But I think that's the core of the idea. And all that requires, it doesn't require a literal um, Adam and Eve. It just requires, it could, you know, like the story I said of the first ancestors, there's no requirement of a literal Adam and Eve here. And you could say that some continuity, not back, 
just to the first humans, but back, but through trace through all of creation, is helpful in understanding the redemption of all creation. Yeah, as the well. redemption. So we're connected because we're connected to the rest, and so our redemption. We're part of creation. Our redemption gives a redemption of all creation, and there is this universalistic theme of redemption of all creation throughout the New Testament, particularly in Paul's, particularly in Paul's writings, or you know. This, some people think the school of Paul with Colossians and Ephesians, but it's there, you know, every redeeming, in Colossians redeeming everything in heaven and earth and below the earth. You find that repeated again and again. Yeah, all of creation, or uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world, all of creation. Yeah, and everything yeah. in heaven, earth, below the earth, you know, so it wasn't just human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, that also means that the universe itself may not have gone through a fall, per se, if if we were limited to hum to the first group of humans who experienced a fall, I, I don't think the universe, you know, went through a fall. So I accept the standard kind of scientific story of the universe, but you know, it's governed by the second law of thermodynamics. So maybe there's a kind of reversal of the second law. So if you want to talk about a fall of the universe, it's just the second law of thermodynamics. Things go from order to disorder. Mm. Though that's somehow that's actually necessary for sun burning and all that sort of thing. It's central to the the system, but it also causes corruption of things. So then there's a reversal of that. We don't know how that's going to occur, but just like if we saw a caterpillar, we'd have no clue. We still don't have much of a clue of how it turns into a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So likewise with the universe as a whole. Yeah, it, it seems like that's another thing that could sort of be um, folded into this issue that God didn't create the universe for just now, just our current physical embodiment as it is now, but created it from the Big Bang all the way looking forward to the redemption of creation. Right, so it'd be this a huge yeah. picture. And that I think if theists need to keep one thing in mind, God's a lot more vaster than our thoughts. For sure. So that um, I think a, a kind of almost theological mistake young Earth creationists make is they, they narrow God to too much to human conceptions of things. If God is infinite and eternal, then it would, you'd think creation would reflect those qualities of God. In fact, we find that in the universe. People look at the universe, mm. you know, and they study astronomy or something, they see how utterly vast it is, just what we can see. 300 billion galaxies, about 300 billion stars per galaxy in the visible universe is probably much larger than how old it is. So we would expect this story to, to kind of blow our minds. <laughs> right. And, um, and I don't think just a simple young earth creationist story, for instance, blows our minds. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of other issues that I, um, I wanted to discuss quickly. <clears throat> um, one of them is about the interaction of the physical world and the non-physical world. Right. Um, so there, there are questions about, you know, angels and all that stuff. I think the biggest issue, though, is the mind-body problem. Uh, I mean, literature is vast on this issue. Uh, I, I thought that was solved. Isn't the soul rooted in the pituitary gland? <laughs> the yeah. pineal gland, yes. The pineal, right, yeah. dang it. <laughs> um, that aside, though, um, there there are some people that seem to – there seems to be an issue with having like a non-physical soul uh, interacting with a physical body. Uh, there are some people that have gone to say there is no such thing as a non-physical soul. Um, so I suppose the question here would be why uh, – what would be – the re well, first, what is your view? Um, and then second, what would be some of the advantages or disadvantages to the alternatives? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm what they call a dualist. I call it entity dualism instead of substance dualism. So, they come to the same thing, but substance is um, people don't, um, in normal discourse, it's not used like philosophers do. So it could be very, bring the wrong ideas to mind. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a separate entity called a soul that interacts with the body. Mm -hmm. All right, so a ghost in the machine, as it were. I wouldn't call it a ghost <laughs> in the machine, but but it's it's a singular experience or center of consciousness. All right, so I suppose the question here is why I think that? What phenomena uh, is is that explaining that can't be met with, say, like a materialist conception? Right, so we have to look at different kinds of materialism. First, there's a reductive materialism mm -hmm. that all, all we are is simply um, like... A, physical machine with biochemistry, and that's the end of the story, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what can't that explain? Well, that can't explain, like, consciousness itself, right? Why is there experience at all? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're looking, we wouldn't, ex we, the physical story excludes, if you give a physical account of a computer, how it works, nowhere in the, 
in there, you're going to find awareness, or as Thomas Nagel put it, there's something it's like to be the computer, mm-hmm. or that the what the philosophers call phenomenal quali, like um, particular experiences, what it's like to experience um, pain or pleasure. Mm. Um, you're also intentionality. The our thoughts are about things. Mm-hmm. Right, you can think about you know President Trump maybe sitting watching TV in the White House. Okay, so uh, you can think about President Trump. You can think about the White House, and if phys- phys- physicalism was the entire picture, that should be a cause of uh, material relation. But there's no material relation you're going to find. Mm-hmm. So the boutness, what philosophers call intentionality, is a big problem. That gets you out of reductive materialism. But why go further? Why not just think? Okay, reductive materialism is false, but we're still a material object with these mysterious properties like intentionality, thoughts, um, consciousness, and things like that. Here is where I think um, entity dualism has an advantage. We, there was another property, and that goes under the name of the unity of consciousness. We have multiple experiences, yet there seems to be a single experiencer. Like you, you're looking at, we're both looking at each other and we're hearing each other. And yet when the brain processes information, it processes it, you know, there's a occipital lobe, there's an auditory lobe all throughout the brain. In fact, even when you read, it gets like one author put it, it's like putting the information in a blender and spreading it throughout the brain. So what brings it all together? And there's nothing they've been able to find neurologically that does. Where's that singular entity? So if it was a physical thing, how do you get the single experiencer? Well, maybe you say, well, it's all the neurons are united together. Well, that's not going to pull the trick because let's suppose, you know, we did a future experiment, your brain and I brain, and we start hooking them together. Mm-hmm. It's not like suddenly there's going to be a single experiencer come into existence when our neurons are hooked together. And if there was, it'd be entirely mysterious because you would have to say at this point, there's no experiencer. And yet there's some law that tells you when you move to this amount of connection of a certain type with mm-hmm. detailed specification, suddenly an experiencer comes into being. That would have to be an enormously complex law. So when you start thinking about the getting of a single experiencer, it's very difficult to get it under any materialist account. And, you know, reductive materialists like, um, uh, now I'm blanking on his name, uh, Daniel Dennett, just deny there are persons. Okay, some people just deny, and you've got, you know, the eliminative materials deny we have experiences or beliefs and so forth. Entity dualism has the advantage here because you build it in, the single entity from the beginning. Like an electron is thought to be a singular, non-composite entity, so is the soul. So it's the singular thing having all these experiences. So that is its advantage. Now, it's not, the soul doesn't explain consciousness. Mm-hmm. Okay, it posits it from the beginning. So it's not that we're explaining these things. We're showing that you, without positing, you can't, you're, you exclude these things. You can't account for them in another framework anymore. So we, it's like a physicist needing to hypothesize an additional particle mm-hmm. with certain properties to get those properties that we need to have. Okay, that's one point to say. Then on the interaction problem, you have to back up and there's a, First major point to say, there's no particular problem with um, material to immaterial interaction than there is in material interactions. How does the sun attract the earth? Oh, gravity. Gravity. Yeah. Well, what are you saying when you say gravity? What does that mean? All gravity is the force of attraction between two material objects. You haven't explained anything. Mm-hmm. You've labeled it. Okay. Okay. And so all the fundamental laws of nature are that way. You know, you might say, oh, I'll count curvature of space-time, general relativity. Well, then how does matter pull the trick of curving space-time? It, it just does. It does. So all, it's than... a label. Gravity is, you know, matter's ability to do this. So all you have is laws that tell you mathematical, they give you the mathematical pattern. Mm-hmm. So there's no, you could have laws link the mind to the body. Now, you do get a thing of they're going to have to be, particular, there would be more complex, and that I have to go into some details, which we don't have time for, yeah, to, for sure. by paper, on how you can greatly reduce that complexity under a kind of entity dualist view. As but, opposed to substance dualism? Substance, they're the same thing. Oh, I, just, okay. I okay. call entity dualism, there's two entities, the material entity and the immaterial right. entity. Um, 
because substance is a more philo- philosopher's term. When you think of a substance, you think of a kind of a continuous thing, <laughs> right. like an ethereal substance. And that's mm-hmm. about what I'm talking about. Philosophers think of substances as whatever you ascribe the properties to. I see. All right, cool. So I have two questions here, and they're just pet questions. They are not related to anyone in the audience except me and uh, the guy who helped write me uh, write these questions. And they're both about fine-tuning. Um, so, And you can be as detailed and granular as you want on these. Um, so the first question that I have is, th- this is me, um, fine-tuning really appeals to me in a lot of ways, except particularly whenever it comes to the constants of nature and um, th- that field. I understand like the initial conditions, you know, mm-hmm. ba- the balance of matter and things like that. What's difficult for me is, um, as an engineer, I have a lot of tendencies toward like scientific anti-realism. And it seems to me like there are a lot of constants I encounter in my field that are not real constants. They're just there to make the curve fit exactly. Uh, and if you monkey around with those constants, your curve stops fitting the experimental data, but that doesn't tell you anything about the object that you're testing. Um, so the question that I have is, why I think that these constants that are describing nature in the fine-tuning argument, why I think that their delicacy is telling us something about the delicacy of our universe rather than just the delicacy of the equations that are describing our universe? Well, first of all, I'll just say I wrote my dissertation defending anti-realism. <laughs> okay. So I attend towards physical anti-realism except for the mathematics because of quantum mechanics. I just cannot see how there could be an underlying material substructure under everything. So I think it's really the mathematics is in the mind of God. So that's just an aside, but I'm sympathetic. Just as an aside, math yeah, is in the yeah, mind of God. Yeah, it's <laughs> math in the mind of God, and God's upholding yeah. the material world. So I, I think that's where quantum mechanics leads you to. Okay. So, but in terms of your question, how do they differ from mere curve fitting? Well, if you, you can fit any in data points, can, an in order polynomial can be fitted <laughs> any data points, but it'll be utterly unpredictive. Okay. You know, the curve will go through the, I can't, the audience can't see right. this, but it'll go through and then go all over the place. So it's very much like um, fitting the stars. You know, we mm-hmm. fit some of the stars to the Big Dipper, but it's not predictive. From knowing that, that the Big Dipper fits some of the stars, you can't predict there's a hand down there, mm-hmm. right? There's stars are going to be in a pattern of a hand holding the Big Dipper, and there's going to be a pot right. being dipped into. You can infer nothing from that. Mm-hmm. Yet when we have our scientific theories, our models, they're highly predictive. Okay. So we think then it makes sense that they're latching on to some underlying structure, even though I think in quantum mechanics, you cannot take the mathematical, the structure we have literally mm-hmm. as a literal map on, but it's getting at there's some underlying structure. That's point number one. So I think it's very different from that. So you, you would think that then maybe not always, but the delicacy in your changing there would be um, reflected in the delicacy of the underlying structure. The second point is what's really going on. If you think about the fine-tuning argument, you're, you have all these poss- you have our actual world and all these other possible worlds, mm-hmm. okay? And when you vary those parameters, you're making a slice through the other possible worlds, okay? okay? And you're saying, here's a natural way of um, measuring the proportion in that slice using the parameter of how large the life-permitting region is. So you could make another slice, but it might be arbitrary. Mm -hmm. So when you make these slices and make probabilities, you want them to be not by any reason to think they're biased. It's much like when you do a drug study. The idea is to, when you randomly sample, is to get an unbiased sample. It might not be representative of the whole at all. Mm -hmm. You might have just by accident be unrepresentative. But you still get that probability because you assume it's unbiased and you say it's very unlikely this would happen by chance because why would I have made just the right chance selection that matches what you would expect from the drug? Okay. So likewise, that's what's going on in the fine-tuning argument. You, You take this model we have here and then that's what physicists give us and then you, that's how you use to cut your slice. That, that makes a lot of sense and, uh, uh, very much <laughs> illuminates a lot a lot of confusion on, on my end. Um, the last question that I have here is actually related to uh, getting those probabilities. Uh, it's professionally called the normaliz- normalizability problem, which essentially says, you know, you can talk about how, um, you know, the uh, cosmological constant is uh, very fine-tuned and there's a very low probability that it would have this value. Um, but it seems like when you start talking about changing the fundamental structure of the universe, 
unlike the drug study example, there doesn't seem to be like a baseline, uh, I guess, uh, like a baseline population that you can normalize to. Um, so I guess the question here is how how exactly do you evaluate these probabilities when it seems like many of these constants appear to be unbounded? Well, first of all, the assumption they're unbounded is false. But even if they were unbounded, I think you could still get you'd get zero probability. But let me just go to the assumption they're unbounded is false. Our models, and like most people realize this, our models like in the four strengths and things like that are limited by there's an absolute limit called the Planck scale. Okay. Because we don't know how to combine general relativity with gravity. So if let's say, let's say the um, the mass of the proton, you start varying it. At some point, you get, you get high enough, about 10 to the 19th power higher than it is, mm -hmm. um, 19 orders, you know, one followed by 19 zeros, it will be so massive that it'll become a black hole. So now you have a very small particle, mm -hmm. which is where quantum mechanics applies, the very, the very microscopic, and you have it a black hole, which is where general relativity applies. And in order to say anything about what happens in that world, you would have to have quantum mechanics and general relativity combined together. So our models assume that, you know, it's assuming a quantum model, it, mm -hmm. first when you vary the, that mass, and because we don't have, we can't apply general relativity, to, we don't know how. Mm -hmm. So the models themselves limit those constants, and the constants only make sense within the models. They're defined by the models they're in. So it makes no sense to move them outside the models. Okay. So most of these variations they talk about are just a naive, you know, philosopher who doesn't really know the physics well, yeah. misunderstanding. But even if they were zero, if they were they're unnormalized, mm -hmm. you would still have... Um, it would say zero probability. An example I give is like you had an infinite universe and you were told by the angel there's a golden planet. On one of, from, there's a golden planet, let's say a billion miles from one of the planets that it's inhabited. Mm -hmm. um, if you started going and you had an infinite number of planets and says it's completely unbiased, I told this to everyone, mm -hmm. all of the planets, you would be utterly a fool to go out and do any effort in trying to find that golden planet around you because you think it has zero probability because it has all those others, even though the whole space is unnormalized. I see. So the short answer then is as soon as you accept something like, say, the gravitational constant, and at that point you're also accepting along with those uh, specific constants, the models that Right, are, that define the yeah, constants. And all of those are limited by All the those Planck little Planck scale. scale at the very, you know, they might be more limited than that. Mm -hmm. but they're at least limited by the Planck scale. I see. I, I think the term that I, I read in one of your papers was the epistemically illuminated range. Yeah, that's that another, way of doing, another way of doing because you really can only vary it. Um, what you're saying is it's like a big dartboard that's all black. You know, most of it's not illuminated. Mm -hmm. You have this little illuminated region where we can make the calculations. Okay. Right. So we don't know what's going on in the other part of the dartboard. But if we have a teeny, teeny bullseye in that luminary region, we see the dart hit there. We're going to say, man, that's good evidence it was aimed. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, maybe that the, bull, the dartboard is infinite and extends forever. Or maybe there's other bullseyes elsewhere. But mm -hmm. that's not relevant. We would still think it was aimed. And the, that's the illuminated region is the one for which we can make calculations of whether that value of the constants is life permitting or not. Well, Dr. Collins, thank you so much for, for your time. And we're looking forward to your um, conversation tonight with All Dr. Right, thank Velasco. You. Um, we'd also like to thank Red Sea Radio for letting us use their studio uh, for this podcast. And uh, thank you, Sam, for playing the role of Andrew Robbins. Absolutely. It was a delight. All right. We'll see you next time. Think Theism is a production of Ross Christi at Texas A&M University. Our producers are Ben Hellyer, Andrew Robbins, and Zach Lawson. Rasha Christie meets every week, and we'd love to meet you too. Please go to thinktheism.org to see our upcoming schedule as well as previous episodes.